burn it at both ends I like the fire cause it mayhem I'm not tired, I've been waiting I'm not forsaken I'm my own and I'm jaded Energy comes from my hatred Call me the villain, cause I be killing I got no feeling, I've been dealing With all my demons, I like to feed them They be chilling, yeah they be screaming I can hear them in my mind They just wanna find any fight, any reason the dark side, there ain't no place to hide All your fears are electrified Welcome to the hard side Where it's all do or die MMA is one of the most brutal sports today, which includes violence and brutality as entertainment factors. Locking two skilled fighters in a cage eager to take each other's heads off is not something that everyone can watch, and many people today still see this sport as barbaric. Their reasons are logical, considering that unlike combat sports like boxing or kickboxing, MMA includes the brutal ground-and-pound aspect that often depicts an athlete getting viciously knocked out. Despite the ferocity and brutality, this sport is one of the fastest growing sports today due to its excitement and unpredictability, especially after the adjustments made over the years to make this sport more watchable by the casual audience. Like, do you think the rules are okay? No. What, do you, what would you change? <clears throat> I, um, <clears throat> I would definitely change the 12 to 6 elbow. That's one. Yeah. I, uh, I always That's thought the that big was silly. Um, you know why that one's illegal, right? Yeah. However, if you think that today's MMA fight is ruthless, you haven't seen the early beginnings of MMA. When the idea for this sport was started initially, there were no rules, judges, scorecards, or weight classes. To determine who is the ultimate fighting champion, be forewarned, there are no rules, no judges' scores, and no time limits. And headbutts and groin strikes were as usual weapons of choice as high kick or an uppercut. We will look closer at the MMA's early days and how this barbaric sport managed to survive and grow over the years, only to become one of the fastest growing sports today. Although many unofficial bouts were held under martial arts rules, only a few are known of, and one such bout was a fight between the boxing legend Muhammad Ali and the Japanese wrestler Antonio Inoki. This bout that took place in the Nippon Budokan Arena in Tokyo, Japan. On June 26, 1976, was billed as the War of the Worlds. Everyone knew how good Ali was at his respective sport, but the question that opened that day was how he would fare against a fighter who was skilled in different martial art in an exhibition bout held under mixed rules. <laughs> with a very interesting set of rules. Put simply, Ali would be allowed to box, and Inoki would be allowed to wrestle. Ali could win by KO, and Inoki could win by pinning Ali to the ground for three seconds. If Inoki managed to get on top of Ali, Ali could escape by simply touching one of the ropes, and then fighting would continue on the feet. Muhammad Ali was the undisputed heavyweight boxing champion back then, and he was coming off a victory by a knockout against Richard Dunn. On the other hand, Inoki was setting bouts against champions of numerous martial arts in an attempt to prove pro wrestling as a lethal martial art and a dominant fighting discipline. The bout was held under special rules and was not as spectacular as someone would anticipate. Look at him, too nervous to eat meat. Can't even get the food in this thing right. And the spoon almost missed his mouth. <laughs> Inoki kept lying down while kicking Ali's legs, and the American boxer was trying to catch him with a punch. Despite the lack of excitement and not meeting one's expectations. Because, like, Ali had never been leg kicked before, and he's f facing Inoki. And look, Inoki's doing this thing, where he's lying on his back. This fight is a precursor to modern mixed martial arts. The first well-recorded MMA events were started in Japan's Shudo organization in 1985, eight years before the foundation of the UFC. It was founded by Satoru Sayama as an effective system of combat that was derived from Shudo.
At that time, MMA was a showcase of individual martial arts, differing from each other, and each martial art had its specific fighting style. In a world full of martial arts, each claiming that their martial art is most lethal, people at that time started to ask the what-if questions. So what do you think uh, is the best martial arts for self-defense? For sure, jiu-jitsu. Yeah, for sure. Wrestling? I, I think grappling, I should say. For instance, what if a boxer were to fight a wrestler? To answer those questions, they devised the idea to create a tournament consisting of fighters of various martial arts from around the globe to see which martial art is the most lethal in a one-on-one -on -one situation. Sure enough, on November 12, 1993 in Denver, Colorado, the first UFC event answered those questions and changed the world of martial arts forever. Dana, congratulations on your first show. That's got to feel good. Thank you very much, James. I appreciate it. We're very excited. we got a sellout crowd here, 5,000 people. UFC 1. The beginning was the first mixed martial arts event organized by the UFC. The first match will be Gerard Jardot against Tali Tuli. It was initially promoted as a real-life fighting video game tournament similar to Street Fighter and Mortal Kombat. This event was built up as something unseen before. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. You are about to see something that you have never seen before. The ultimate fighting challenge. With no judges' scores, gloves, or time limits. Unlike today's UFC, where specific rules must be followed, UFC 1 had no rules except for biting and eye gouging. Eight of the deadliest fighters in the world were set in a tournament to determine who is the ultimate fighter, and with that, what martial art is the most lethal human weapon. The event included Royce Gracie, world lightweight Brazilian jiu-jitsu champion. Small, skillful person could beat a larger, stronger opponent who didn't know the techniques. Well, he proved it. He proved it. I'm a Royce Gracie proved it in the UFC, and he changed martial arts forever. Patrick Smith. The number bowl one is super heavyweight kickboxer in the United States who held a ranking of number five internationally. Art Jimerson, IBF North American cruiserweight boxing champion, Gerard Gordeau, world heavyweight Sabbat champion, Zane Frazier, the WKF super heavyweight Kenpo champion, Ken Shamrock, the number one ranked shoot fighter in Japan, and an MMA legend that is well known even today, Taylor Tuli three years pro sumo champion, and Kevin Rosier, super heavyweight kickboxing champion. The first bout in the octagon was between Gerard Gordeau representing Savate and Taylor Tuli representing sumo. Looking at it from today's perspective, that fight was unimaginable, considering the weight difference between the two. The sumo wrestler was a massive 410 pounds figure compared to his opponent, who was very slim compared to Tuli. It seemed that the sumo champion could just run over Gordeau like a tank over a car. However, that fight came as a shock to many, and here is why. The Dutch fighter entered the octagon giving the Nazi salute to the audience. We spoke to Gerard earlier about his strategy. I'd like you to understand exactly but what he said. Considering that the audience was there to see blood and violence, none seemed bothered. As the fight started, the sumo wrestler tried to close the distance by charging forward. Gerard Gordeau prevented the clinch, and Tuli fell as he failed to pressure the Dutch striker against the cage. At that moment, Gordeau landed a vicious soccer kick to Tuli's face, knocking his tooth out. Taylor loses his balance. Now he stops, they both hesitate, and now, bam, right in the face. Followed by a big punch, ending the contest. The referee was forced to stop the bout in a matter of seconds, and Gordeau was declared the winner. The massive 400-pound figure turned into a pussycat, trying to gather his tears while realizing what had happened. Seeing people getting kicked in the face like that is not something you see every day, and the event was just getting started. The second bout was between Kevin Rosier, representing kickboxing, and Zane Frazier, representing Kenpo. The kickboxer went after Frazier, trying to close the distance, keeping his opponent on his back foot. The Kenpo fighter tried to keep Rosier at bay and deliver precise strikes that could end the bout. However, in the fight's opening seconds, Rosier went all in, recklessly attacking the opponent and dropping him down with strikes. He then landed heavy ground and pound punches and strikes on the back of the head, which were allowed. The Kenpo fighter managed to get up, and attacked the kickboxer with an excellent right hand before pressuring him against the cage. Frazier then landed a knee to the groin that clearly hurt his opponent. Oh, that was a clear 
three-point shot. But the rules allowed that, and the fight continued. He then went with deadly knees and strikes combos, trying to end the show right there. However, the kickboxer gathered himself up and threatened with punches and elbows from the clinch. Although Frazier landed some good uppercuts from that position, none were strong enough to knock Rosier down. The kickboxer attempted a bulldog choke on Frazier but failed and fell. The Kenpo fighter didn't know how to capitalize on the failed attempt since he was not skilled in grappling but punished him with a knee to the face. Yes, indeed. Shortly after, both fighters were visibly tired and looked like two drunk men fighting. The kickboxer was slightly fresher and went after Frazier, eventually knocking him down with strikes. He then punished him with brutal punches to the side of the head. and stepped on his head until finally, Frazier's corner threw the towel for the rescue. Kevin Rosier was declared the winner. The third bout was between Royce Gracie, representing Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, and Art Jimerson, representing boxing. Most people believed that the boxer would take Royce's head off with a punch, considering that boxing was widely regarded as a lethal martial art, while nobody back then knew what Jiu-Jitsu was. Royce Gracie shot for a double-leg takedown, getting Jimerson to the ground easier than anyone could anticipate. We're watching Royce take the mount position. And that's exactly where the jiu-jitsu man wants to be. He's on top. He then controlled the boxer from a mount position who did not know how to defend on the ground, since grappling was a completely different universe for a striker like him. After desperately struggling to escape that position, Art Jimerson tapped. Now, <laughs> take a break and take it off. <laughs> well, he just bowed out. He just tapped out. He just tapped out. Did he? And Royce was declared the winner. Finally, the last quarterfinal bout was between Ken Shamrock, representing shoot fighting, and Patrick Smith, representing taekwondo. Shamrock took the opponent down with a beautiful body lock. Ground contact and ground grappling. And there's a nice clinch right there. And that's probably... And that was the right strategy against a stand-up fighter like Smith. Shamrock controlled Smith from a guard position by pressuring him and throwing heavy ground-and-pound strikes. Then, out of nowhere, Shamrock went for a leg lock and forced the Taekwondo fighter to tap. No. Or chokes or anything, I think he just wants to kind of wear him down. Exactly, got some good, good balance there. Uh-oh, watch this, there's a foot lock. Watch it. Now, this is one of the foot locks. Just like that, Shamrock was declared the winner. In the semi-final, Gordo faced the kickboxing champion Kevin Rosier and immediately started kicking him on the lead leg. The kickboxer, visibly tired from his last bout, had nothing on the feet for the superior striker and was shortly pressured against the cage. It's not in the thigh, it's not on the muscle, but it's right on the joint. The Dutchman went after him, punishing him with vicious strikes to the head, followed by a stomp to the body, and the referee was forced to stop the fight. In the second semi-final bout, Royce Gracie went immediately for a takedown against Shamrock. However, the American was ready for that and defended it. Nevertheless, after a scramble, the Brazilian got himself to a dominant position and managed to finish Shamrock with a choke. Oh, the kids back up. There's, Royce, there's the tap. There's the tap. Royce actually had him in a choke from the back. That fight will turn out to be an overture of one of the biggest MMA rivalries in history. In the final, Royce Gracie faced Gerard Gordeau. The game plan for the Brazilian was apparent when he closed the distance and got Gordeau to a clinch position. After some struggles, he finally took him down and choked him out via rear naked choke. Watch, it, watch Royce's left hand. He's going to take it, and he's pushing hard to break. There's a bridge to break the wall. Yeah, here comes the I would be surprised if the arm bar shows yes, up here real quick. to me like it could be. History was made. Royce Gracie became the first UFC champion. Not only did he become the world's ultimate fighter, but he proved to anyone the superiority of jiu-jitsu and how lethal this martial art is. After the UFC 1 event, MMA started to gain popularity through organizations like Pride FC and UFC. During the 90s, there were a few bouts worth mentioning that could be considered shocking by today's standards. At UFC 2, Patrick Smith was beating Scott Morris mercilessly, and the referee, Big John McCartney, could do nothing about it. 
The rules prevented the referee from jumping in and saving the fighter, and Morris's corner refused to throw the towel and save their fighter from further unnecessary punishment. He's very, very strong. He hasn't moved at all during the attack. Good shot, there. No, look at that. He's going to get out of the way and give him a hand. Patrick Smith was killing Scott in front of thousands, which is something that cannot be seen today. That fight indicated that the UFC needs adjustments, especially in the refereeing rules. Thankfully, Patrick Smith got up and walked away from beating Scott. The UFC 2's announcer, Ben Perry, was famously quoted referring to Scott Morris. We don't know much about him because he is a ninja. At UFC 3, Keith Hackney faced the sumo master, Emmanuel Yarbrough. The American delivered 41 hammer fists, punches and forearms to the down sumo on the way to ending the fight literally breaking his hand in the process. Let's not forget that he was doing that without any gloves. At UFC 8, Gary Goodridge caught Paul Herrera on the ground in a gooseneck, where both Herrera's arms were trapped. Goodridge proceeded to smash Paul's face with devastating elbows, ending the bout in 13 seconds, the same amount of time Conor McGregor needed to finish Jose Aldo years later. All these brutalities over the years were noticed by U.S. Senate McCain, who described the sport as human cockfighting and started campaigning to ban MMA across the USA. All of that was allowed. Senator John McCain, you know, famously uh, called the sport barbaric, uh, like human cockfighting. How fair do you think the criticism? As a result, the UFC was dropped from the major cable pay-per-view distributor Viewer's Choice and TCI Cable. The sport was banned in 36 states, and this was the beginning of the UFC's worst days, known as the Dark Ages. Considering all the pressure, the UFC had to make some significant changes that could make the sport more watchable. They implemented weight classes and mandatory gloves. They added new rules like not allowing hair pulling, groin strikes, headbutting, fish hooks, or kicking a downed opponent. By UFC 21, they introduced the standardized 3x5 minute rounds, rebranding MMA as a good sport rather than a spectacle. Almost 12 years after the first UFC event, the owners, Lorenzo and Frank Fertitta, and UFC President Dana White had already invested millions and millions into this organization. Still, they were not getting much in return. It looked like they would call it a day and step down from the organization, something that could have ended the growth of MMA forever. Luckily for us fans, they made a last-ditch effort by creating a reality show, The Ultimate Fighter, in an attempt to show the personalities and stories of the athletes outside of the octagon. It was a success. But whether it would save the UFC was another story, and that burden seemingly fell on those competing in the show's season finale, which aired live on Spike TV. The Ultimate Fighter finalists, Forrest Griffin and Stefan Bonnar, delivered one of the best MMA fights in history, a fight unseen before, a war that is still talked about today. That night behind the venue after the fight, the UFC and Spike TV agreed on a deal to keep the ultimate fighter going. The fight looks even. The fight looks even. What a razor close fight, razor close. But it's three rounds. History was made and the UFC would not just survive but thrive.